Hi. Welcome to Mondays with Marlo. I'm very excited to have our guest today, Lucinda Scala Quinn. I love that name more than anything. Well, you know how great she is. She's got Mad Hungry uh, show on the Hallmark Channel. She's Martha Stewart's expert, uh, food, top food expert. But I'm also excited to have you because it's holidays are coming. Everybody wants to know how to do great, quick meals. Yep. And also, you're really like one of my tribe. The fact that you have three boys in your life and a husband, that's four altogether, right? That's correct. So when I married my husband, I had five. He had four boys and him. And trying to get them to eat at the same time was impossible. And you don't want to be without food with that many guys no. around. It's like a herd of elephants coming well, at you. Exactly. But also, they never sat down together. So, I mean, they, one of them was ate in the den and watched television. The other one was upstairs doing homework and writing while he ate. So it, it was a big deal for me to get them to come together. But also, not only did they eat a lot, but they made such a mess. Yep. A mess that I thought they never really saw. They probably didn't. I, I think that they make a mess, but they don't play games with your head. You know what I mean? Boys are just what you see is what you get. <laughs> and I like that. I, I always say that I replace lampshades the way most people replace light bulbs. <laughs> But you know, so so I try to teach them a little bit, a little bit here and there, you uh -huh. know, and and about to becoming responsible. Yeah, a little bit. Uh -huh. Yeah. See, my whole premise, Marlo, is you know, cook cook for the the men you love. Teach them to cook for themselves, mm -hmm. and they will pass it on. It's not about like me being the cook and doing it all for them. Right. And and how do you do that? You well, have to start early. You right? start really early, and you first teach them about food you mm -hmm. know you can engage them in the process like if you have to drag them to the supermarket rather than thinking of it as such an onerous experience you can kind of turn it into a little bit of a right. teachable moment you know here's a peach smell it if it doesn't smell like a peach it's not going to taste like one uh -huh. you know give them a little you know when they're a little older maybe you give them a little uh, list for themselves and they go to the maybe the bread section and you say get the one with the house on it and they come back and they're all happy oh, so, how great. Uh, yeah, so I just always engage them I never was, you know, about having them cook when they were young. Right. It was just involving them and getting them to the table. I liked the way it felt to be with them. But I think it's brilliant not to be the mom that says, dinner's ready, and they say, what's for dinner? Yeah. So no, no, no. You're, you're part, they're part of that. They're part of it. They're, and now, I mean, now they're, uh, one of them, could, now they're completely engaged. And their dad is a cook, too. I mean, uh -huh. I don't, you know, he got, you know, I work, and we, we tag team. Oh, that's great. You know? That's great. And now they cook. I well, mean, well, we'll talk about. We've yeah. got a million questions for you. So we should sure. get to that. This is from Terry, and Terry's right in there. Hi, Terry. Hi, I was Terry. wondering if you had any tips on how to spice up leftovers. Put an egg on it. No, I am dead serious. What? My favorite. That is it. That's a term that means I'll oh, get out of here. Put an egg on it. Oh. But one of the things that my kids eat more than anything is the next morning. In fact, just this morning, I'll take whatever the leftover is and I'll fry an egg and put it on top. And what was the So leftover? I had some uh, rice pilaf from last night, uh -huh. and I made extra. Uh -huh. I do that in advance. I make extra when I'm making rice or potatoes or whatever. And I just put it in a bowl, put it in the microwave, fried an egg, put it on, a little bit of hot sauce. Oh, that sounds good. And it's good. That's one tip for leftovers. Oh, that's great. Do you have yeah. another one? I have another one. Oh, yeah. Um, so in my book, Mad Hungry, I have these things called man, man crepes, and they're just big crepes. Uh -huh. So I'll roll anything up in that, put it in a dish, put a little cheese on it, and put it in the oven. And and suddenly you have crepes, especially <laughs> after Thanksgiving. Oh, I'll just sure. put everything out, oh. or after Christmas, I'll just put everything out. And so people, the turkey and everything. Everything, and then they, and I'll just take like I'll slice the turkey. I'll have the cranberry. I'll have the side dish. I'll maybe have some cheese, a little other, and have all those crepes made. And then they just roll them up themselves, and you can just eat them or you can bake them. Oh, that sounds delicious. A little different than you That's know great. your typical sandwich. That's great. This is from KP from Cleveland, Ohio. Hi, Lucinda. I just love you. I have three active children, two boys and a girl who never stop eating. What are some tips on cutting back costs for weekly grocery shopping? Our weekly grocery bill can climb to $300 some weeks, and that's just too much. I work part time. I am so on the same wavelength as you. And no matter what my situation has been through the years, I have been really mindful of that grocery budget. That's why I don't want to resort to fast food or ordering pizza, because that's more expensive than actually planning. So A, plan. B, half of cooking is shopping and you really as you know should do that like on a sunday or a saturday morning but i really think you need to introduce to your family's diets legumes and beans that is the biggest bang for your buck you'll ever get for a pound of dried beans it's about a dollar 39 and mm -hmm. that rehydrates into six cups of beans so here's a meal you know 
ba uh, black beans, you have cut up avocados, tomatoes, some lettuce, a little bit of um, scoop of sour cream, maybe some tortilla chips. And it's a vegetarian meal that is really satisfying. Mm -hmm. So I skip meat once a week. Uh -huh. you know, and I also make a lot more, uh, like, like I said, rice, polenta, whatever that is. And think of the meat stuff as more of a condiment, not mm. so much that that's the but center of the plate. But is that more flattening to have all that rice and polenta? No, no, I, I don't mean, I, what I also mean is I always cook two vegetables. And uh -huh. I look for what's on special. Mm. I look at vegetables that are often maligned and try to make them nice. What's and, a maligned vegetable? Well, well cauliflower is kind yeah, of maligned. And Brussels sprouts. But if you take cauliflower and you slice it thin, you put it on a baking sheet, you toss it in olive oil, salt, and pepper, and you cook it in the oven, in a single layer at high heat, it gets golden and crispy, and it's almost like kind of like a potato chip. Oh, that sounds good. It's so good. Oh. Now I even have to make two heads of cauliflower when I oh. cook cauliflower. Oh, God. I can't wait to watch this so I can write everything down. Uh, <laughs> same with Brussels sprouts, by the way, Marla. You yeah. can do Brussels sprouts the exact same slice way. Slice them up. That's good. Just slice them in half and roast them at a high heat. Sounds great. Erica, you've mentioned in your book that men don't see and process mess like women do. What are some tips? We love tips. Yes. What are some tips to get your whole family engaged in cleaning up after meals? Everyone wants to come to the table and eat, and no one wants to stay after and clean up. Thank you. My mom, who I, drove me crazy when I was growing up, she assigned a task to every single person, and she was really hardcore about it. To the point where she also made one person's job was to set the table the night before for breakfast the next day. Oh, great. Get out. And, and it was just these little things all add up. <clears throat> Excuse me. I really think you don't for, take for granted the teaching you have to do. So teach them how to load the dishwasher, and you're going to have to keep doing it over and over again and I hate to say it but you have to tie rewards to this activity <laughs> is it computer is it television is it money is it cell phone I take no prisoners when it comes to this because <laughs> I want a boy going out into the world that knows how to clean up after right, himself. Right, exactly. That's wonderful. Um, this is from Millie. Oh, how many children in your family that your mother had all those four? Four. Uh -huh. Four children, and she was, uh, you know, at a time in the in the fifties when fast, you know, you know, convenience food was being foisted on right. moms everywhere. She stuck to her plan. It was a very simple plan, but she, you know, all my brothers l cook for their families. We oh, all enjoy great. being at the dinner table, and now. You know, Mom, I'm very grateful for what oh, you did. That's great. <laughs> this is from Millie. I have three kids, and they all have competing areas of food pickiness. Were your kids picky eaters, and how did you handle that? Sure. Everybody's got picky eaters, but I don't really go in for that. Like, I'll hear people say, oh, all my kids will eat is Pop-Tarts. I don't know what to do. Oh. Well, you have to early on be diligent about making vegetables and that sort of thing that tastes good and part of that right. is technique like i told you about the broccoli right. i mean about the cauliflower if you take spinach and steam it forever so that you have a pile of liquid and mush who wants it right. but if you take spinach and you clean it properly you just barely wilt it and then you toss it with a little lemon juice right. it's tasty and that's then you develop people who like to eat that right. if someone doesn't like broccoli don't give it to them. If they like peppers, cut up fresh peppers. Eventually, they'll like it. My one son hated onions, so but he loved Brooklyn. He loved visiting Brooklyn. So we told him that they were Brooklyn onions, and he <laughs> loved those onions. That's so funny. Another one hated mushrooms, but when we would ever have Chinese food, he'd always order the mushu pork, which, of course, was filled with wood ear mushrooms. That's so funny. It's just funny. But they'll come around. Just don't force them and give them lots of choices. My youngest stepson, when I first moved into their house, I'm Italian, so, you know, salad, salad, yeah. salad. And he said to me, I put the salad down the first couple of nights of dinner, and he said, I don't eat anything green. <laughs> oh, so, God. Them's fighting words. <laughs> no. Well, I have a whole point of view on salads, so <laughs> Do you? we can oh. come back to that okay. if you want. Okay, all right. Um, this is from Ryan. My youngest daughter has just been diagnosed with severe food allergies. We love our family meals, but are wondering if we should create completely separate meals for my daughter, or should we all eat what she eats? Well, that's a really, really interesting question, and I think it so much depends on what your personal circumstances are and what the allergy is. Because, for example, if it's, um, if it's one or two isolated things, I would educate everybody and just make something that we can all eat together. Let them get their food elsewhere when they go to their friend's house, you know, right. if it's wheat or if it's dairy, whatever it may be, if it's peanuts, if it's peanuts and it's so serious, get that out of the house. No one's going to miss right, it. Right, right. You know, yeah. do something different and, you know, rally around her and all, you know, you'll teach something in the process. Mm. But if she's allergic to too many things, then you have too to... Too many things, then you clearly have to... You know, but it still would be nice to find common ground. Something yeah. she loves and they right. love. Right. Or maybe you're making... I'm making this up. A marinade for a chicken that has, let's say, um, 
peanuts in it and she can't eat peanuts, then maybe you leave the peanuts out and put everything else in the right, marinade. Right, something right. like yes, that. Right. Because you don't want her to feel like marginalized. Right. You know, yeah. then it's not fun. That's what the thing about eating together is it's fun and it makes you feel good. Right. I mean the Italian families teach exactly. teach you this unwillingly That's unwittingly. Right. Togetherness. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. This is Betty. Hi, Betty. At what age did you start involving your kids in the cooking process beyond licking the leftover batter of the spoon? Very good question, Betty. Not as early as you'd think. I hear a lot of food people say, oh, I, my kids have cooking. I'm more interested in getting them to eat, to pay attention to what's going on. And then when they get, usually it's about, you know, 13, 14, they want more allowance. And I say, forget it. You got to help with the family meal uh -huh. or you got to help. And, and that's when, and then I start to teach them little by little. And I think they really need to be a little bit older to get engaged in that process. Right. You know, not eight, nine, ten. Sometimes you'll have somebody who's just sitting there and all they want to do is be in the kitchen. That's a different story. Well, I like your idea of taking them to the market and You take them the to the market, you make it pleasurable when Absolutely. you travel. Yeah. Um, if you're fortunate enough to travel, no matter where it would be, Go to the local market. That's often the center of the community. Right. You know, there's st there's certain foods that come from. I love to seek out regional foods. Oh yes, You know absolutely. that are just of the place you're visiting, right. and give that enthusiasm to yeah. your kids. Oh, that's great. This is live from Karen. I started cooking dinner a few times a week to my husband's surprise, but now he expects it. Am I setting a bad precedent? Help. No, you're not, because you're nourishing yourself and him. And if he ex maybe he should pitch in too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe you should, maybe he needs to learn one thing he could make, you know? Yeah, so it's a trade off. Just one thing. He doesn't, you know, maybe he makes pancakes and that's the only things he makes and he makes right. it on a Sunday morning, right. you know? But I think that it's, forget about your husband, no offense. <laughs> it's good for you. It's good for you to cook the food you eat. It's a healthier practice. Yeah. But, but everybody should help, though. Everybody Other has nights. to pitch Other in. Other nights, maybe, yeah. maybe he can shop for you. Maybe he can clean for you if he doesn't want to cook. But I'm, I am not about being somebody's, you know, sitting there and being the one with the apron in the kitchen. I think everybody needs to participate. Right. And everybody will benefit from it. This is from Lanny. I really want to start eating more fish, but I have no clue how to make it. Also, and it's healthy for the family. So what's a good starter recipe for fish? Uh, Lanny, mm -hmm. you are saying what so many people tell me. We're told to eat more fish. We don't know what to eat. Right. First of all, uh, my experience has shown me that people <coughs> really like salmon. And the thing about salmon or any fish is it has to be fresh. When people say to me, "How can I don't want to cook fish because it makes my kitchen stink. I'm like, well, you're not getting fresh fish. Right. So yeah. you got to go somewhere where you know the fish is fresh. And you need to speak to the person who handles your fish and learn about it. And just try one thing. I have in Mad Hungry a salmon with teriyaki sauce, which especially if you have kids around, it's just a familiar flavor and it gets you into the fish. So I would start there. I, I would try that. something like we that. We do that. Yeah. And it's I don't just, really it's like, like fish. A, yeah. Yeah. But you, you're supposed to eat I'm it. Because I'm a Catholic. Because <laughs> we were forced to eat we it on Friday night. Fish, right, so oh, the haddock fillets. No, oh. The haddock souffle that my mom, now, <laughs> please, we could go on and on about that. I know. It's a hard sell, but you know what? It is an important one. And one more thing about fish is you, sh you don't need to eat it all the time. It's, it's, our, our resources are depleting. Right. They really are. So find a fish like salmon that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Arctic char is another great fish right. at the market. It kind of eat. is salmon, isn't it? Arctic char. It looks like it. Yeah. It tastes like it, right. but it's not. <laughs> uh, this is live from Tammy. Do you have su suggestions for how to make chicken less boring? It's my preferred meat for my family, but they are sick of it, to say the least. I have about probably 10 chicken recipes in my book. Oh, is it in your book? It's in my book. because This is her book, and it's really fun, And this the thing book. is, is because I am the same as you, uh, it's totally the thing that everybody wants to eat. So... Uh, I think I don't, the only thing is like chicken don't have fingers, so I don't use chicken fingers. <laughs> if I want to, I'll make them if you have little kids. But there's flat roast chicken. Here's a very, very quick thing. To roast a simple chicken takes about an hour or more. So I discovered when I had this herd of starving boys, if I cut the backbone out of the chicken and flattened it, and roasted it at 400 for 40 minutes in the oven, and you can flavor it however you want. It keeps the, the breast stay moist, the thighs are moist, everything cooks, it's a beautiful oh, wow. thing. And there's a recipe for that. It's, it's got a light, like lemon tinge. I have a vinegar gloss chicken that they love with, with chicken thighs. I like thighs are a great thing to cook with. Um, and I like orange juice on chicken. Oh, that's wonderful. Orange is a great combination yeah. with chicken. I take the chicken, uh, boneless chicken breasts that you that you buy at the market and slice them thin and make a paillard and put salad on top. Oh, that's great. And, you know, kind of that's an Italian kind right. of a Milanese type of thing. And it also goes a long way. It goes a long way and it's good. You know, yes. you just have to learn how to cook it properly and that's not hard. It, you cook it. Um, don't overcook it. 
You don't want dry chicken. No. That's no, a drag. I know. It always feels that way. Uh, this is from Nicole. You talk about bringing the family back to the dinner table. Why is that important? I look at it as one-stop shopping for wellness. It's like the beginning of a community. Like it takes a family meal. Talk about it takes a village. It takes a family meal, especially when you've got a bunch of kids around who are maybe like surly teens or whatever. And you say, okay, it's dinner time, one dinner, only cooking one dinner. And they sat down and they're like, mm. you know, you don't ask them, how's your girlfriend or what'd you get on your report card today? You say, just watch. Suddenly it'll be past the potatoes. Someone will eat potatoes and they get a little chicken inside and then suddenly you'll hear someone say something to someone and if you sit back and notice, you will notice there's a full-fledged conversation going on. You're interacting with the community of your family. So and you're that saying is a, you don't have to start the conversation? No, 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 no. And be smart. Like, they might not want to talk to you about their life, but they're going to want to eat and they'll talk to you about that. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's my strategy. That's great. Uh, any tips on how to do it? Oh, this is the same person. This yes. is Nicole. Yeah. Any tips on how to do it for a busy family of four with crazy schedules of bringing the family together? Yeah, I have the same problem as you do. And what I, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying have all your meals together, and I'm not saying you, you know, eat together every night. Pick one meal you could do a week. Just yesterday, I had the same thing. People coming and going. I made a giant pot of lentil soup. And I made a bunch of croutons, big crispy croutons. Yeah. And it was just on the stove. And people came and went and they had their bowl of soup. But I knew that they were eating good food, healthy food. Back to the comment about affordable food, delicious lentil soup is so affordable and so satisfying. Right. So just aim, you know, don't don't overwhelm yourself. Aim for one night, one meal. That's great. Well, and that's, then see if you can add another. And that's, that's, good doable. Enough. that's doable. That's doable. That's yeah. doable. That's what you, you can't put too much pressure on yourself. Okay, here's a live from Storm. Hi, Storm. So we followed your advice. We have fantastic family meals, but now I've gained 10 pounds. Do you ever have to manage your own weight while leading your family? Well, the thing is, is that we're all pretty active. I'm not an, I don't go work out like a crazy person. I have a dog who I walk every morning for 30 minutes. Um, I would rather put whole, weight on from wholesome eating than the kind of weight that comes from the unhealthy part junk of food. junk food, where you have uh, issues that relate to diabetes and blood pressure and that sort of thing. So it's really just an organic approach is what I take. Go for a walk. Right. Go for a walk. Well, also, you don't have to have starch with every meal. Well, you also, portion control is pretty big. Yeah. You know, and that's where weight comes on. If I mean, the food's pretty darn good in our house, and you want to just keep eating. But especially, I broke my ankle, so my dog walks out the window. So oh, in the gosh. last week, I've been, I've been really paying attention to maybe just being a little more careful about how I eat. I find, though, when I, don't, when I want to uh, keep my weight down, I drink a glass of water before I start eating. Great idea. And I drink water all day yeah. long. So if I, if I have a glass of water before I start eating, and don't go for the bread first, yeah. eat the salad, eat something first, the yeah. water, then some salad. But if I don't have the water and I go for the bread, the whole meal you're, you're is gone. So, the you're meal is gone. absolutely right. And I think the thing is, is that you always have to have lots of vegetables. And I mean, honestly, we have lots of vegetables around that I cook. I have a big bowl of fruit that sits on the counter that people take from. Water, 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 yeah. water. I don't buy sugary drinks. No. Um, and and I, I think that's really, really important to keep yourself hydrated and eat lots of fresh yeah. vegetables and whole grain when you can. Like, oh, try sure. to make brown rice instead of white rice right. and see what that's like. Mm -hmm. And granolas. Yep. This is live from Phoenix. I'll be honest, I'm horrible in the kitchen. Well, welcome. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> I can't even make pancakes that don't come out misshapen. Where do I start? Well, I, I, I suspect you're not as horrible as you think you are in the kitchen. <laughs> and Mad Hungry is really a basic building block uh, book. And, I, and if you are interested, you should take a look at it because it'll teach you exactly how to get started. Did we, we didn't the say that. The whole front of it has... Let them say it's called Mad Hungry, Feeding Men and Boys. It's, okay. But the important part is the recipes, strategies, and survival techniques because there's lots of ways that it's not intimidating. And if you read the front of the book, it tells you how to wade in. And I have had feedback from so many people who said... My life has changed because I didn't think I could cook. I can cook. My mother oh, never cooked. Great. I learned oh, to cook. Great. And it's a really beginning entry level cookbook. And uh, so start simple. Here's live from ETB. What kind of cooking oil do you use? Is olive oil the best and the healthiest? I use um, extra virgin olive oil. I buy it in bulk. I use it for almost everything. And when I'm not using um, olive oil, I use safflower oil. I do not use canola oil. Safflower oil is a... Um, What's wrong with canola oil? Well, it's just a personal thing. I mean, some people love it. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't love it. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not all the rage behind it from a health standpoint. And I also don't like... People use it because it doesn't have flavor, but whenever it's cooked, I think it, ha it brings a kind of a fishy scent to your food. And safflower oil is amazing. I love it. 
and mm -hmm. uh, it goes to a high heat. And you know, olive oil I even use on my skin. So you know, I'll you're use an Italian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's live from Louisa. How many times a week do you really have family dinners? Uh, it's not. It's not. I couldn't say. I would. I mean, at least three or four. I mean, I, and for my work, I'm supposed to go out to eat all the time, and I'm just happy when I'm home. I mean, I really am. Is that a dinner or just at three or four meals a week? Some are lunches, some are breakfast? No, dinner. Oh, dinner. Dinner, yeah. Uh-huh. On the weekends, we, um, we have a, you know, well, it's staggered. The boys are older now. I mean, my 17-year-old my son got up and made a giant bacon egg and cheese at 3 <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. <laughs> Nothing I could do about that, yeah. but at least he was making himself something to eat. <laughs> this is from Isabel. What's your favorite healthy dessert recipe? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, is there one in your book? Dessert. Oh, yes. There are so many. Um, I have a whole page on quick desserts that are, are simple. Like, for example, I'll take, I'll take orange and I'll slice it and I'll sprinkle toasted coconut over top. That is delicious to me. It satisfies me. Um, let me just think where we go. So a lot of those healthy desserts like, you know, are... Um, you know, let's see here. Sometimes I'll take a fruit sorbet and I'll put club soda in it and make a float. Oh, how good. Uh, or maybe mash a little few pieces of um, strawberry in there and I'll uh -huh. put strawberry sorbet, which is very pretty much low calorie. And yeah. then and then the club soda just bubbles up like a real kind of root beer float. Oh, that's neat. Um, I like apples dusted with a little bit of cinnamon and a little bit of sugar, not too much. And Dr. Oz says cinnamon is good for controlling your weight. It is. Yes. And also ricotta cheese, which is a wonderful cheese, which is inside the cannolis yes. that, that you might love. Well, if you just mix that with a little bit of chopped dark chocolate and a little drizzle of honey, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, that sounds yeah. great. This is from Leanne. I love Lucinda's shows and recipes. I have a 15-year-old son who loves to eat but doesn't love to cook. Do you have a recipe or menu that you would suggest as a starting point for him? Wow, what a great question, Leanne. And I can tell you there is a pasta, a carbonara in here, and that spaghetti carbonara. And that was, I even said, my son called me one day, and he was about 13, 14 years old. He was with his friends, and he wanted to cook. He wanted to cook something. And I was panicked that if I gave him anything too hard, he, he wouldn't handle it. So this has literally uh, one, two, three, four ingredients. I, they make it all the time. What's it called? It's called spaghetti carbonara, and it's super simple walk him through it and he will feel like a million bucks and oh, he can make great. it. Yeah. And then after that teach him a vegetable to go with it, but don't go that You're way. leaving me this book, right? Yes, this is yours, Marlo. <laughs> teach my husband and the boys. Okay, this is um uh this is live from Trudy. Hi Lucinda, I love you. What do you do when you eat a meal someone else has made for you, like a friend's dinner party? <laughs> That isn't good at all. Oh, God. I mean, it's always in my napkin. I don't know what to do. Do you tell them it's good to be polite? Do you tell the truth? My friend is a horrible cook, and she always has people over, ironically. I don't know how to tell her. I keep coming up with excuses of why I can't make it. That is so it is funny. funny. What I, you know, my, my theory in life is to always try to find the positive in something. And so I'll, I'll I, no, I pretty much don't say, the only people I'll say that to is my family members who really ask me, because they know not to ask me unless they want truth. <laughs> but with my friends, I, if I know my, it's going to be a bad meal, I usually eat before I go. Or plan yes, to I eat, do that. Or plan to eat after. Um, I'll find one thing, like if they say, do you like it? I'll say, I'm so happy to be cooked for. I'll say something like that that isn't negative, but right. that's a tough one because I'm a real hound. I can I have this I cursed or blessed with a nose and me a too. palate. I can smell things a mile away. I can taste them a mile away. And when my family sees me going like this, <laughs> they know that I'm trying to figure out what's wrong. And then sometimes I'm not happy. And the thing I I, I, I detest is that taste of preservatives on my tongue oh my from processed food. Yeah. That's just me. That's why I'm such a proponent of cooking no, that's great. Know, home food. This is from Matt Kill Stitzberger. What is your suggestion for an unusual appetizer to take to a holiday get-together? You know what's unusual? Unusual. Um, even, well, you know, if you want unusual, I have an Indian spiced chickpeas in this book that I serve, I, and I'll take them often to get togethers with. I'll take some pita bread or some, and I'll, a little bit of yogurt and uh and people build their own, and it's un very unusual. It doesn't cost a lot of money, and people love it. If you want to go more, um, you know, a dip is always a yeah. good idea. Um, What's one of your favorite dips? Have you got one in the book? Well, it's funny. My new book, which I'm writing right now, and I just made it yesterday, was this caramelized. Remember, you know, onion soup dip? Oh, yeah, I used to love so, that. So, yeah, so I make one which is caramelized um, onion and bacon dip, and it's pretty amazing. There's all kinds of dips you can make. If you um, go to madhungry.com, you can look up. I have like a spinach, a healthy one, which is just yogurt and spinach 
and watercress and dill, uh -huh. and that's really good. Um, watercress phyllo is so good dough is amazing. Don't be afraid of it. You can make a million things out of it. It's um, and you can make little appetizers. I'm trying. I don't know why I'm blanking a little bit on this one. You can come um, back to it. Yeah, because I do have lots of yeah. uh, ideas for traveling with hors d'oeuvres. Now this is a live from Gretchen. Do you make beef? And how often do you have meat at your dinners? And what are other sources of protein? Great question, Gretchen. When I suit market during on Sunday, I think in my head, I'll go like a chicken, a beef, a pork, and then maybe I'll say a pasta, a bean, a soup. And that's how I channel it in my head. I would say we eat beef about once a week. I actually buy beef from one particular place where I know where it comes from. It's just one of the things. It's a little bit more money, but that's what I do. And... Um, where, where does it come from? Well, I, I, you know, I live in New York City. On Lincoln Center, there's a little farmer's market, and there is a Mennonite family that sells meat that they raise on their, on their farm. It's Piedmontese beef, and it's, it's lower fat. It's got phenomenal flavor, and every single cut of it cooks up beautifully. I'm a real proponent of knowing where your meat and fish come from mm -hmm. and using. But, you know, a lot of us can't do that, and a lot of the time you go to the grocery store, and it's a question of looking for what's available and affordable to you. Um, what other sources of protein? I'm the bean queen. I make beans or beans. legumes once or twice yeah. a week. Um, and and I just um, I have to say we're little by the way yes salad. like Greek salad with lots of chickpeas right, right. Um, the hummus. Chi -chi, one, hummus, hummus is chickpeas perfect one of the things that my Italian grandmother would make that didn't freak me out on Friday night <laughs> um, when we couldn't eat meat was chichi de pasta which was the simplest recipe which was really a little olive oil and garlic and you, you canned chickpeas and then add some chicken stock, some tomato sauce, and then you cook little shells and you combine them together. And oh, the little great. chickpeas get sort of snuggled inside the shells. Oh, and great. that's a wonderful uh, way to get protein in. I love tofu and I cook tofu, but tofu is one of those things that a lot Very of us hard. were like ruined from like bad yeah. 70s right, health right. food. Yeah. But if you uh, cook it well, it can be amazing too. Yeah, and also you can put different kinds of flavorings on that. Those are, Completely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like to buy really hard tofu mm -hmm. and slice it and get rid of the moisture and use the same teriyaki sauce I use on right, my salmon exactly. in here and then roast it really high, and it's that, almost like a teriyaki steak. Yeah, we did that with teriyaki, too. This is Lucinda. Uh, oh, my this, mom. See, our family loves your recipe for Rose's meatball sandwiches, oh. and it's now a tradition to have them Christmas Eve. Oh, my gosh, that makes me so yeah. happy. <laughs> What's another of your favorite scala Twin starters that you think are a perfect partner for those unique meatball oh, bites. Oh gosh, this, I, I like, don't know. I, I'm, I'm blanking on like my appetizers now. M meanwhile, my mother's already started making bags of those things, <laughs> those meatball sandwiches. She puts them in bags in the freezer. Well, tell us about the meatball sandwich. What? What? Well, first of all, very quick, quick, quick story. My mother is not Italian. My mother is um, Scotch Irish. But she took a lot of the Italian stuff and she made sense of it. Rather than a stuffed artichoke, she'd make big pans of artichoke casserole, which made sense for a family. Anyway, I went on TV and I made Rose's meatball sandwiches because I grew up eating them. My mother made them. And my father called me after the show was over and he goes, those are your grandmother's meatballs. <laughs> and he was mad. And I said, but my mom is the one who made those for me. <laughs> so what she did, she took meatball meat and she slathered it on thin bread and then she put another top on it. She cut it in quarters and she roasted it. And so you have these little meat, mini meatball sandwiches that you oh. just pop in your mouth. And what kind of bread? She uses the Pepperidge Farm extra thin white bread. Oh, right, uh-huh. I mean, she's got her way. That's. Uh, I was thinking it'd be sourdough, usually. No, 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 because she wants really thin oh. bread. This is, again, this is convenient. You know, this yes. is her version of convenience right. food. Right. I right. don't have anything to offer for you, except for I'd probably make a pretty good cocktail to go with those that could go either <laughs> soft or hard. And Very that's my good. other big thing with drinks, is I like to make both. This is a great question. This is from Angela. What are five spices to always have around the house? Spices, and I would have, I would have cinnamon, I would have thyme, I would have uh, ginger, oh, ginger, always ginger, cinnamon, thyme, ginger, oregano, and let's say, what would one more be that Garlic I Garlic powder? No, no, <laughs> never. Uh, um, let's see, nothing powderized like that. I'm just trying to think, what do I always grab for? Uh, I don't know, I'm stumped on the fifth. Rosemary. Uh, rosemary. I keep that in my garden, but I yeah, love rosemary. Rosemary's fabulous. Um, okay, we're running out of time, but I'd like to get to some tips. This is from Trish. Great question. What are some tips to cooking in bulk on a Sunday for the whole family? Let's just get the tips out. Well, just yesterday, I made this giant pot of of a lentil soup when I got back from the grocery store. They ate it and then I put two quarts in the freezer. At the time I was having to deal with the soup, a chicken was in the oven roasting. 
not for dinner that night, but so that I could take all of the uh, shredded chicken off and make tacos on right. Monday, tonight. Tonight will just be tacos where I'll put a bunch of stuff out. So I'm always on, on I might make um, a lasagna for dinner, stick one in the freezer. I know I'll have it the next week. So in other words, Strategy. while you're cooking, it, it, it's about, your yep. tip is to strategize for it's, the week. That, and that's really in this book. It's like when you come home from the grocery store and you're putting stuff away, start getting stuff ready. You know what I mean? Put mm. something in the marinade for dinner later. Cut up the broccoli. Wash the potatoes. Maybe get a soup going. And then think about what you're doing Monday and Tuesday. Right, right. That's Stay great. one step ahead of the game. That's great. Let's just give you a couple more here. This is live from John Whitfield. Welcome, John. I always buy chicken quarters and cut the backs off before I cook them. Is there a way I can make oh, stock yes. out of these? You know what I do? I take those backs and wing tips, and I put them, water, a little bit of salt, maybe a garlic on the back of the stove, and I let that cook away. And then by the time I need a liquid for the chicken, maybe the chick has been roasted, then I just remove all that other stuff, cook it down, and make a little sauce or a gravy or something like that. You don't have to make a big fancy stock. You just take those backs, a little garlic, some water, and salt, and cook it for about 20 to 30 minutes. Strain it, cook it down, and you have a chicken stock. Great. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to rush a few in here. This is live from Nat. Hi, Lucinda. What are some healthy starch and carb foods? Whole grains is a place to start, uh -huh. really. Brown rice. Um, uh, quinoa is phenomenal, and it's high in protein. You just have to learn how to cook it. Uh, those would be my two top places to start. Barley's great. Farro is great. Uh, spelt is great. I mean, this is a whole litany of things that require a little bit more energy, but check them out. And uh, actually, go to madhungry.com if you have any further questions we're not answering, too, because I can, you know, sometimes write back and help you. And this is from Chana. My family's always so busy. Everyone's always doing their own thing. Can you offer some suggestions for how I can get everyone around the dinner table at least a few times a week? Cook something that smells so good that they <laughs> will not leave. Steak pizziola is my thing. It's in the book. And when it's cooking... I don't care where those teenagers think they're going. They are always making a beeline back oh, to the really? house to eat. Oh, that's so yep. great. And, and one more. This is from Patty. My girlfriends and I get together once a week to kill a bottle of wine. I always put out chips and dip, but that gets boring. Do you have any other cute snack ideas you could share? Wow, lots of uh, uh, cute snack ideas that you can, what would I, oh, well, you know, I, I wouldn't, how about a little bit of a <clears throat> charcuterie? Don't be afraid to just get some lovely sausage a little bit of cheese, some crackers, and maybe two or three different mustards, some cornichons, little pickles, maybe some capers, a few things like that, and just put it on a nice board, some sun-dried tomatoes, and it's kind of like grazing, kind of an antipasti, and it's just a little different than chips and dip. Uh, this is interesting, live from Stephanie. Do your kids eat at their school cafeteria, and what do you think of the quality of food in school? I, I work on behalf of changing that. I think it's terrible. My kids always were sent with their own food and they started bugging me if I could they could get school food and I was really upset about it but I thought you know what let them try I let them try <clears throat> my son Miles came home after about a week and he said um, can I go back to getting your food and could you make double and I said <laughs> why he said I can't eat that food I feel like I'm gonna get sick and I feel friend sorry for my friend who eats breakfast and lunch at school and I oh, feel wow. bad for him so we started making it's a bigger huge issue in this country right. how we feed our kids and how it relates to disease okay this is the last one we have time for because I'm getting all kinds of hooks here this is from Deirdre I'm visiting my boyfriend's family this Christmas and I'm responsible for bringing a dessert and I really want to impress them and they only live an hour away can you offer any cool dessert ideas that travel well? Oh, I love pavlovas. Those are knockouts, and that's made with egg whites. And you basically make a big, beautiful, undulating egg white, and then you, can, um, you fill it with, like, cream and fruit. And you could do that if it's only an hour away. You could make the pavlova. You could, which is the, the meringue, and you could travel with it. And when you get to your location and chop up your fruit, and then you just whip some cream when you get there and you put the fruit on it. It's glorious. Another thing that's a little bit more friendly to travel with is a um, bunt cake because it's contained in the pan. They're usually super moist. You can put a glaze on them. I have a chocolate one in Mad Hungry that is um, actually one of the first cakes I ever learned how to make, and I, it's the cake I make all the time. So this question is from Catherine. Hello, Catherine. And she says, holiday time is so crazy. Between getting the gifts and the family arriving, I don't have a lot of time, but I have to make a great meal. How can I pull it off? Yeah. Uh, that's everybody's well, problem. That's everybody's problem. But the thing is, you think at Christmas you have to make this big thing that knocks you out that takes forever. 
So last year I did a Christmas dinner in under an hour. And one way that I did it is I strategized by putting a few things in the freezer to begin with. I started with the idea of a beef wellington. Now that fancy thing, right, which was it's a tenderloin of beef and it has a mushroom duxelle and foie gras around it and then pastry. Forget it's it. That's so old good. fashioned, it's so good, but it's though. really good. <laughs> so I bought a uh, tenderloin and instead just a plain tenderloin, which I'm not always a tenderloin lover because it doesn't have enough fat for me. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. It's expensive. So I look at it as a gift for the holidays and I'll invest in it. It cooks fast, so it doesn't take a lot of time. And I put a little, I, so I start deconstructing that tenderloin by putting a little bit of um, a mustard butter around it and roast it. Meanwhile, I take uh, phyllo dough which instead of the pastry, which you buy, it's a convenience item, you buy it from the supermarket, and I make little cups inside muffin tins with, with mushrooms filled inside. The mushrooms have been sauteed with a little shallot, a little cream, um, and that's about it, some thyme and a little bit of wine, and just fill those mushroom cups, and then I stick that in the freezer, and that's ready. That's just in the freezer. I do that a week before. Potatoes, I take the potatoes, peel them, and then slice them very, 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 very thin, and those get roasted at the same time as the meat gets roasted, and they fan out like this beautiful fan. And it's just a simple potato, but you've got all that sauce coming from everywhere else. And then, um, I'm just trying to think, what else did I make with that? Uh, so then I will do something at that time of year with, I love frozen peas. I mean, I'm a fresh vegetable fanatic, but frozen peas, you're never gonna get them better unless it's, you're picking them out of the garden. So I'll do peas and I'll just, and they take two minutes to cook. I'll take some little red onions and saute them in a little olive oil on top of the stove, put the peas in, and so you have your peas, you have your potatoes, you have your little mushroom cups that cook. When the meat comes out of the oven and it's resting, then you cook your mushroom cups, and that whole thing comes together in under for an hour. For how long do the mushroom cups? Those cook for about ten minutes, which is as long as it takes for so your. Hot. It's yeah. so hot as long as it takes for your meat to rest. That's great. Yep. I'm starving after talking to you. <laughs> Me I too. Really am. I don't know what thing to go eat first. <laughs> well, our, our time is up, as you can see. We still have so. I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds of questions for you, but uh, there you go. I can't do any more. Thank you so much. Listen to thank. You. Thanks, Marla. Really. Great question. I haven't felt this hungry in a long time. <laughs> And uh, get her book. I, I have mine. And I'm really looking forward to reading it and, and making something from it. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next Monday.